Today on The Grave Talks, a conversation about One Night in Salem, The Hidden History of the American Witch, a new book by Troy Taylor. In his new book, One Night in Salem, The Hidden History of the American Witch, Troy Taylor takes us back to when witchcraft first came to America with the European settlers. They had fled at a time when thousands were being accused, tortured, hanged, and burned for being witches. They arrived in America looking for a fresh start and brought that fear of witches with them. That fear and dread became hysteria when evil came to Salem Village, fueling hostility, distrust, and religious fanaticism that claimed the lives of innocent people on the gallows. But Salem was not the end of America's obsession with witchcraft. I'm Carol Hughes, and on this episode of The Grave Talks, we continue our conversation about the hidden history of the American witch with author Troy Taylor. When we think of witches, I think so often people associate witches with devil worshiping. This entire conversation that we've had up to this point, there's nothing that has... Has anything to do with devil worshiping? No, not even the folk magic that is meant to be harmful. Even that doesn't have anything to do with the devil. You know, I mean, it just doesn't. Um, That's that's an old that's an old school belief that rooted in Europe and was brought here by the Puritans. You know, they believed that the witches were in you know some kind of league with the devil. They had to sign the devil's book. They had to make a deal with the devil. But that all kind of faded away. And um, we still, but but not completely, of course, because find a person who's even just semi-religious. Let's say they go to church on Sundays, but they're not you know, devout or you know fanatic or anything. And if you bring up witchcraft, they immediately think it has something to do with the devil mm-hmm. because that's what organized religion has painted witchcraft with when it doesn't. People who will tell you that they're a witch or they, they follow Wicca or something, none of that has anything to do with the devil. None of it does. And yet that's, that's the way people get stuck with it. Um, you know, people who um, are, you know, who, who do worship the devil and, and for the most part, even people who, even Satanists don't worship the devil. That's the thing, um, <laughs> you know, but it's, um, you know, that's a, that's a whole different, has nothing to do with, with witches and, and witchcraft, especially our modern and our American versions of it. I think this whole book is really interesting because it's sort of revisionist history. What really happened in Salem, the Puritans' view, kind of, that's what ended up being passed down. Mm -hmm. That's what happened. They were witches, but they weren't. And, or at least the definition of witches that they were using, you know, these women had nothing at all to do with that. No, not at all. But, you know, the winners write the history. You, so technically, yes, yes. you know, they, they, they're the ones who, who felt that they triumphed here, even though in, if you look at it in real life, they did not, as far as they were concerned, they, they eliminated 20 witches from their ranks, even though none of these people were witches. And, you know, what they did was create um, something that has never gone away and eventually led to the downfall of the Puritan faith winners write the history. And so that's the way even it doesn't matter how many books have come out since then that have told the true story of what really happened there. We're always going to have the, you know, the, the, the cotton Mather versions and the judges who were on the panel. They're the ones who never apologized for what they did. You know um, when it was all over, there were a lot of these people slunk out of town, but not the main ones. Um, you know, one of the judges was a, you know, a, an ancestor of Nathaniel Hawthorne, the writer and uh, Hawthorne, they changed their name uh, because his, they didn't want it to be connected to this judge. But, you know, the people who were there, the people who did these things, they weren't sorry for what they'd done. They felt that they'd done the right thing, uh, which is just as delusional as some of the other stuff that we hear today when, you know, a group of people commit suicide because they think they're going to hitch a ride on a UFO that's following in the trail of a rocket or they're, you know, holed up in a, you know, compound in Texas. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's all the same thing. It's this fanaticism that grips people and um, they, they, you know, it's what was going on in Europe and this is what was going on in New England. And 
unfortunately, it still happens. It just doesn't have anything to do with witches. <laughs> you know, that's that's the main point here. <laughs> and I think, too, when you look at folk magic, a lot of that was people trying to be helpful to mm-hmm. other people. Mm-hmm. There was no real medicine in that day. No, there was no scientific no. medicine. And so they were using what they knew passed down from generations as cures for things. Right. And, the, well, and what the Native mm-hmm. Americans were using to treat fevers and headaches and illnesses. And they blended it into their own. You know, that's the thing. They were blending it in, making medicine from it, using the medicine that they were shown uh, and that they had learned that works. And by giving it a little bit of a flourish, you know, just adding a little bit to it. You take this medicine, but when you do, make sure you go out and stand in the moonlight to do it. And when you do, you say this Bible verse. Because like with folk magic and conjuring, the, the Bible became a very important part of it. Um, and they would use verses for certain things, like to stop bleeding or to stop a stomach ache. There are all kinds of stories like that. And, you know, by, by t- giving someone this medicine that if they just sat down and took it was going to work, they might not have any trust in it, no faith in that medicine. But if they were told to go outside, stand in the moonlight, uh, put one foot in the river and say a Bible verse and it'll work, they're, that they'll do, you know, that they would do. And so that's, that's how a lot of this stuff, um, a lot of these things have ended up being passed down and why there's still a consistent belief system in it even today. People still practice folk magic. I mean, there are so many people that I know and I've met. I've got people that work for me who identify as a as a Wiccan or as a witch. And they are pretty much just doing the same things that our ancestors were doing, you know, in the middle 1800s in the hills and hollows of West Virginia. Hadn't really changed that much. It really hasn't. I mean, voodoo is another perfect example of an American uh, folk, folk faith, folk religion, folk magic. I mean, it didn't start out as being American. Obviously, it was brought here to our shores. Uh, the African Americans that brought it uh, changed it and adapted it and turned it into something American. And uh, it's the same type of thing. You know, it's it's full. It's filled with stories of cures and 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 help for people and treatments. And you know, again, you're you're given. Um, it's it's just a different kind of um, a different kind of entity that you're you know adapting or. or, or connecting it to, you know, instead Mm -hmm. of going out and standing in the moonlight, you might burn, burn an offering to uh, one of the various gods on an altar um, and then take the medicine because you need all of it to make it work. It's, it's the same type of thing. Don't you think that voodoo is kind of the same as witchcraft in that it's gotten a bad rap because when people think of voodoo, we think of spells being cast that are harmful and trying to bring someone else down Kill them, Mm -hmm. harm them, hurt them in some way. Right. I think that's how most people think of voodoo. Well, because every type of every type of magic um, will have just like anything does. There, there's a dark side to everything. Um, It just depends on who's practicing it. But voodoo itself is not is not only it, it is like witchcraft in that it's it was definitely painted the wrong way and it was given a bad rap and there was a really important reason why voodoo and hoodoo both have been given this really bad rap it's that's all about race i mean in the beginning witches became evil people because of religion and then voodoo became evil uh because it was you know 90 percent african african americans who were performing it who were involved in it and so then it must be scary they must be plotting something they, and that's that's really how it started, even in in New Orleans, which grew to accept voodoo for what it was, um, which is what it was. What it is, is what makes it different than witchcraft is that it is an actual religion. There are gods involved. There are deities involved in voodoo where, I mean, even hoodoo is not a religious practice and, and folk magic usually really isn't too much either. Early on in New Orleans, they were afraid that by allowing the you know, the slaves that had been brought there to practice their religion or or practice voodoo freely, that they were maybe going to overthrow the the white government. And it's had a bad rap ever since, even if, even as it began to be accepted uh, in New Orleans, at least as a tourist attraction, essentially, they still, people still had a fear of it. It's shown that way in in movies. It's, you know, turning people into zombies, sticking them with pens, you know, I mean, (laughs) 
Yeah, it, it is. It's the same thing as as witches. We're supposed to be afraid of it, and there there isn't anything to be afraid of. They're not doing anything any bit different than anybody else who's practicing their own kind of faith. So with a witch hunt, which now every time I say witch hunt, I think of Donald Trump. Oh God! But no, he, he's the guy's plagued by him. Yeah. But, yeah. Right. But um, so we think those as a thing of the past. Into the 1900s, were there still? Oh, were yeah. they still going after? Yep, yep. It went on, and f- some some of the last ones that I could find any record of um, were uh, as as more, as recently as the 1950s, where people were believing that they had been cursed or hexed by someone that they were a witch. But most of the time, I found that one common denominator that I began to find as time moved on and things became more recent, and people were still believing in uh, witchcraft. I found a couple of cases that came out of the Southwest um, that they believed that they had been cursed by a, a bruja, which is a you know uh, Hispanic name for uh, a witch. Uh, but most of those seemed to involve mental illness. Um, the, the, the people who were accusing others, normally it had some sort of um, dementia or some sort of nervous breakdown. And then began to believe someone was a witch, but then unfortunately would would commit murder, uh, which you know is a bad ending for the stories. Obviously, most of those stories in more recent times that that seemed to be the answer behind most of them. Yeah, people were usually just locked away in a hospital somewhere uh, rather than punished some other way. Yeah, it it didn't it didn't continue. Uh, I mean, there has been even up in the 1960s and 70s when witchcraft became more of a popular thing that the Wicca movement became real and more and more people began to identify with witchcraft and Wicca. The persecution really stopped. I mean, there there's still there's always going to be an issue with religious groups, uh, conservatives, fundamentalists, you go around saying you're a witch, they just automatically assume you worship the devil. It goes back to that same problem again. So there's always going to be some of that, but I think that we, you know, we see it and can view it a completely different way today. And that was one of the things I was trying to do with the book is to, I I, I don't know if I want to say normalize it, but essentially it is normalizing it because it's, it's a part of our culture. I mean, the U S army accepts Wicca as a religion, you know, it is an actual religion now. So people can use that on their, you know, in, when they enlist in the military, you can use that, you know, on your tax returns or whatever, you know, whatever you need it for, you can use it. Things have changed. And then there are other ways, like you said, every time you hear witch hunt, do you think of (laughs) someone who deserves to be hunted (laughs) down, but um, we won't get into that, but, but it has become something that we all recognize. And we think of Salem and, and that these people were being persecuted for something they didn't do. That's how it's being used. Uh, I don't know what the right terminology would be for you being pursued by something that you actually did do, but I'm sure there's (laughs) there's something out there. (laughs) That's a whole nother podcast. Right, exactly. (laughs) Could you dive in a little bit into the Wicca movement? Because I think that's another one that gets a bad rap where people associate uh, Wicca. Obviously, they're witches, they're devil worshipers. That's pretty Uh, much how it goes. Wicca, you're a witch and you worship the devil. And yeah, that's, which is and hilarious again, because not the Wicca case. doesn't even believe in the devil. That's not even part of their, you know, heaven, hell, devils. And that's not even a part of it at all. Um, it got its start in the 50s in England, actually. Um, a guy named um, Gerald Gardner started the, the Wicca movement as, you know, which good timing because w- Britain had just repealed all the old witchcraft laws. And so they could kind of come out of the closet, so to speak. But he wasn't, uh, you know, he wasn't an expert on anything. He had worked for the Foreign Service. Uh, he had an interest in history and archaeology. And around that same time, there had been a lot of talk of, from uh, Margaret Murray and some other folks about uh, witchcraft really dating back to, you know, before the Inquisition and things and kind of coming out of the pagan movement, which some of their stuff turned out to be accurate. Some of it turned out not to be. But anyway, he got fascinated with it and claimed that he had encountered an ancient witch cult 
uh, in the forests uh, of England in the 40s. And that's kind of where things started to go. And then in the 50s, he started to turn it into an actual movement and begin getting a lot of people involved in it. There was a falling out between he and some of the people who were involved, like his um, original high priestess. And then I honestly, I think she probably put more of a more more dynamic on women being involved. And that's the thing about Wicca today. It seems to be, I mean, there are plenty of men who are involved too, but it's definitely geared toward women. Uh, they are the top of the, the food chain when it comes to Wicca. You know, they're worshiping the goddess. They are, um, all the leaders usually are female. And so Wicca then began to get involved with, um, you know, the feminist movement that was starting to take off. Um, it came to the United States in the 60s, and it it just started to really get a lot of attention. And again, like you said, people just assume that you, you must worship the devil or you're evil or something, but none of those things are true at all. I mean, the, it's all about nature worship and you know the feminine divine, and it's um it's a it's it's a really it's a very peaceful, uh, very. Um, it, it seems to be, it seems to work for an awful lot of people. And as I mentioned, it's now been accepted and recognized as, as being official. I, I don't think that it would have been Wicca alone. Um, and there were other people who were becoming popular around this time too. Lori Cabot in Salem had become uh, popular. He started to see her in the newspapers and things. Uh, Sybil Leak was a, uh, was a witch from England who came to the United States and really um, became popular here. Um, and so people were starting to see them in magazines and things like that, especially in the 60s when, you know, the occult and magic and the new age was really starting to take off. But more than anything else, and this is this is this is the most American thing I'm going to say right now, <laughs> more than anything else that led to the popularity of witchcraft in America in modern times was the premiere of Bewitched on TV. Really? Yes. Yes, you because they find made it, it so be, adorable. <laughs> yes, because it was so normal. Here is a witch who doesn't is beautiful. Elizabeth Montgomery was a knockout, and she lived with her husband who worked at an ad agency in a suburb in a perfectly normal neighborhood. And you know, of course, her you know her family they were all crazy because it was funny. You know, it was a fun show, but she was so normal that suddenly witches weren't scary anymore. It went on for seasons, several seasons, and everybody loved the show. It was one of the most popular shows on television. You know, they went to Salem. They did a two-part episode in Salem. There's a reason why the, the village of Salem today um, has a statue of Elizabeth Montgomery as Samantha uh, in their town square because she put the place on the map. Uh, honestly, when they did the show there, it, it started a tourism business there that's never stopped. But it was Bewitched that did more than anything for the image of witches in America, because, you know, that's what we <laughs> we don't have a royal family here. So we have movie stars, right. and TV shows and pop culture, and it's pop culture that turned everything around. Don't you think it's interesting, given everything we've discussed about Salem and how horrific that was, that they've turned it into this tourist place where you can go and kind of celebrate that? In a well, way. now yeah, I have not it's, been it's to Salem, and I do well, want to go. There's two I sides. Do. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be there again this fall. I've been a few times. You know, it's got two sides to it. Is the thing. I mean, they they don't they don't shy away from the fact that 20 innocents died there. They you know they will reenact the witch trials and the ridiculousness of it. So that's what you have on one hand: a bunch of people who died that were accused of being witches who weren't witches, right? Then on the other hand, you have this. Well, on the other hand, it's the Halloween capital of the world mm -hmm. because that's the other thing that they embrace now is witches. So on one hand, you had people who weren't witches, and now we're going to talk about how great it is to be witches. There are all kinds of witch shops there, and that's, I mean, that's their image. I mean, that's that's what you go there to see. It is odd. I mean, but I mean, it works for them, I guess, but it is odd. I guess the 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 best thing you we can say about it is that it does it it does try to paint things in a normal light so that witches aren't seen as devil worshiping you know old crones that hold hang out in the woods and wait to eat little kids you know what do you think about Salem as far as being haunted by any of the people 
since this is what you do for a living sure, too. Sure. Well, you know, there what are, are, thoughts I mean, there are an awful lot of places in Salem that are said to be haunted. And I'm, I'm sure that the, you know, the trauma that was suffered there by a lot of those people mm-hmm. definitely could have left an impression behind. Uh, I, I mean, I can't, I'm not going to stand and say that I absolutely know that every place there is haunted because I haven't ever experienced anything there, but there are an awful lot of people who have, and there's certainly a good reason for the town to be haunted. Even if you leave out the witch trials, any town has its ghost stories, especially one that's old, that's seen as many people through yes. the seaport as Salem has, and how many people have been through there and the things that have happened. You've, you've definitely got an area that's ripe for haunting. It's an old part of the country, but then add in those witch trials and all the the, the people who died and the the hysteria and the 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 grief and all of that, the trauma leaving an impression behind there, you you definitely got a place that certainly can be haunted. Absolutely. Can we talk a little bit about you? And since we were just talking about hauntings, so you have a, a website that I would highly recommend for anyone to check out. It's American Hauntings Inc. INK.com. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And on that site, you'll get a lot of information, but you do some really fun things <laughs> that people can join you on. You have ghost tours that you do. There's a spirits and what is the spirits one? You have dinner first and go out. And oh yeah. We've got like dinner, and spirits dinner and spirits events. Um, they, they, they vary. Uh, we have some that, you, you know, have dinner and then we'll, we'll take you on a tour. Uh, some of the tours, um, we, and we do this, uh, Alton, Illinois is kind of our base of operations, which is regarded as one of the most haunted small towns in America. It's just right across the river from St. Louis. So in the middle of the country, we had a lot of people who come through there and it's, the town's got a reputation anyway, but um, we uh, will have dinner. Uh, we take a, a, a bus tour. We either go up the river road and visit some of the little towns along there that have history and ghost stories. Uh, we also have a tour that stays in Alton after dinner. Um, we also have a lot of dinner events where people come, they have dinner, and then afterwards I'll do a presentation on a variety of different stuff, um, including witches. Um, but I do a lot of different things. One of the big things I talk about probably more than anything is the the St. Louis exorcism from 1949. It was a, purported to be a real event that would provide the inspiration for The Exorcist, the book and the movie. Uh, it's the true story behind it. So I do a lot of those. It's just fun. It's, it's really fun. And I guess I, the way I look at it is that, yes, this is my job, but I want whatever I'm doing to be fun, not only for the people who come, but for me too. Because if I get bored with it, it's not going to be fun for other people. Right. That's just why I switch things around a lot, because I don't want to get bored with it. And I really enjoy doing it. I love to tell stories. I love to introduce people to things they've never heard of before. Um, next weekend, I'm doing one on H.H. Uh, H. Holmes, the uh, you know the Devil in the White City. Oh, and I and the Chicago love World's to, Fair. It's sold yeah, out. It's, you know, I noticed, and, and but I would tell love the story to do that. behind yeah. it. You know, uh, because a lot of people only know very little of that story, and it's it's that way with a lot of stuff. You know, and so yeah, we do a lot of that. We've had ghost tours in different cities. We do ghost hunts um, in Illinois and a lot around the surrounding states. Uh, people come and they'll stay at a haunted location and they can, you know, bring all the investigation tools and gadgets and gizmos they want to bring. Or if they just want to sit somewhere in the dark with a Ouija board, they can do that if they want to, whatever. We don't put any restrictions on them unless the the, the, the location does, but then people can experience these places for themselves. You know, people can't afford to rent an entire location to themselves. So this way we do it as a, and we keep the groups pretty small because we don't want them to interfere with each other. But that way everybody sort of pulls their money together and gets to experience a a place maybe they've only heard about or read about and wouldn't be able to go on their own. That's, that's kind of the idea behind it. And you also do a haunted America conference. Yeah. Now, I'm excited about that. I came across yeah. that months ago, and I thought, I think I want to go to that. Yeah. And then yeah, as we... I'm researching you for this podcast, <laughs> yeah. I was guy. like, wait a minute. <laughs> and so I really want to go. Now, is that to someone who's listening right now who's just interested? Oh, you yeah. do this every year. So if you miss sure, the conference yeah, in 2023, in there'll be one next year. And the, at the time we started it in 97, there were no ghost conferences. This was the first one. 
Um, I got the idea, believe it or not, I got the idea because a buddy of mine was going to a Sherlock Holmes conference. Um, and, and I thought, well, that's interesting. What if we did something like that for ghosts? And so we started doing it. And so 97 was our first one. And this is our 26th year. We only missed one year. Um, and we all know why it was in 2020. This year, we moved to a new location. We usually do it in a hotel and we just have run out of space. Uh, so we're doing this at a college, uh, also in, right outside of Alton, Illinois. And again, across the river from St. Louis. So it's easy to get to by plane, car, plane, train, automobile, whatever. And um, we put together, you know, there have been a lot of conferences that have kind of grown up after us that have come along. And a lot of those, I wouldn't call a conference. I'd call them a convention because they'll just bring in a bunch of people from TV shows and have them sit at a table and sign autographs. We don't do that. Our conferences are always speaker-based. Um, it all revolves around the speakers. And so I get a lot of authors, a lot of people, very knowledgeable, come in. They'll do their presentation. We will have vendors and things, of course. Um, and after our tours and workshops and things, this is definitely so far our biggest year. But it is so much fun. We have so much fun doing this. It's gotten so that, you know, after so many years, while it's a lot of work, um, it all just sort of, uh, you know, you can just kind of, you, you, you just know what you want to do and you make it happen. And, you know, we have a, we have a huge raffle that we do every year as part of the conference. And we find the weirdest stuff you can possibly imagine <laughs> uh, for the raffle. Uh, we've given away everything from slightly used caskets to one year we gave away a bus. Um, this year we've got Victorian hair wreaths and embalming tables and, everything in between. Uh, it's just, we, we find haunted things, you know, people give them to us. They tell us they're haunted. They had them in their house. They want to get rid of them. Oh, well, I'm happy to send them home with somebody <laughs> else. So it is a lot of fun. And, and I look forward to it. I mean, I start planning it, uh, the week after it's over every year for the next year. And this is going to be a really good year. And, um, yeah, you can find the link to it on, uh, the American hauntings Inc website or it's got its own site it's just ghostconference.net so but hopefully you're gonna be there carol you i really would love to go um, so yeah and if, love for you to if someone's listening to this and it's 2025 well there's a new conference coming up <laughs> yeah this there'll year. be another conference in june so uh, it's always the third week of june so it doesn't it doesn't matter what year you listen to the show it's it's gonna happen this has been such an interesting conversation and when i came across your book, I thought, I really want to talk to this guy about this because I think that with witches in particular, they've always, the term is so negative and it's just mm -hmm. so complex. There's just so much more it to it. I love that you go back to the Salem witch trials and talk about that because once again, the story that we think of now that happened isn't really the story that happened. Right. right. And so I like exactly. that you dive into all of that. So you can... Download the book. In fact, if you go to his website, I saw that you can get an autograph copy. Oh yeah, sure. That way, yeah. so that yep. would be that would be awesome. And the book is One Night in Salem: The Hidden History of the American Witch. You can find out more about Troy as well as his books and the ghost tours and the, the ghost hunts and the, you do everything <laughs> haunted American conference and a podcast. You also have the American we do Hauntings podcast. podcast. Yeah, yeah, we do. I think uh, I keep busy until I look at you and I'm like, man, uh, <laughs> well, goals. Yeah, the podcast is is something that I I did not want to do. Uh, my uh, I, and now I can't imagine not doing it. But my my co host talked me into it in the first place, and now we're on our seventh season. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, we, see we how, do a season see that, how yeah, that worked out. I know. I know. We do a season that lasts an entire year each time. I mean, I will plan it out at the beginning and we'll pick a topic. I mean, we've done various different topics, you know, over time and um, it's, it's, it's so much fun. I can't, I can't imagine not doing it now. Yeah. Wherever you listen to podcasts, you can find that. I want to say thank you so much for your time today. This has been really sure. interesting and really informative. I'm good. And well, thank I you. really, I appreciate really appreciated that. So thank you so much. And sure. if you would like access to all of our episodes, including the archive and advanced episodes, everything commercial free, you can become a gravekeeper, sign up on Apple Podcasts. You can try it for three days free. Also go to patreon.com slash the grave talks and find everything there. Also ad free for all of us at the grave talks. I'm Carol Hughes. And thank you so much for listening. <laughs>